Good morning, everyone. Beautiful, beautiful day. As per usual, whenever we get together, we start off with charity, prayer, and study. So charity, I have my tzedakah box here. <clears throat> I have my coin. That's what charity is. People think that you need, it has to be uh, uh, a lot of money, just a coin in the box. And that sound, that sound makes an effect. It stirs the heavens. So that's our charity. And prayer, we will do um, Psalm 122 which has become the psalm that we've done uh, here. So um, I'll just say it. You're welcome to join me if you have your book. If not, I'll say it and you can uh, say it with me. I'll say it in Hebrew and English. Yisrael. <laughs> Adonai Shemrecha, Adonai Tzilcha, Yad Yeminecha, Yomam Hashemesh, Loyakeka, Beyerech, Balayla, Adonai Yishmar Chomikora, Yishmar Et Nafshecha, Adonai Yishmar Tzetcha, Uvoyacha Meatavi Adolam, a song by David to be sung on the steps of the Holy Temple. I lift my eyes while atop the mountains, searching from where my help will come. But I know my search is futile, because my help comes only from God, and I must look only to Him, for He's the Maker of heaven and earth and oversees the affairs of this world. God is a worthwhile support because he will not let your foot slip. Your guardian does not slumber even for a moment and will always protect you. For behold, the guard, the guardian of Israel does not slumber and certainly does not sleep. God is your guardian. God is your protective shade, always at your right hands to protect you from danger. The heat of the sun will not harm you by day, nor the coolness of the moon cause illness at night. God will guard you from all evil. He will guard your soul. He will guard you in your going and your coming, now and forever. Amen. Now we go on to our study. I thought today, um, I would talk about unity, and I would also talk about um, power and soul and the power that we have to uh, inspire ourselves and inspire others. There are many who say that there's a war in a faraway land called Israel. I believe they're mistaken. And I think a lot of us understand this now, that the war is not in a faraway place. The war is against every single Jew, man, woman, child, non-binary, wherever in the world they may be, there's a war. Yesterday, we saw that very clearly right here in Montreal at the university at Concordia. We were there. The, the peddlers of terror do not hate Israel because they wish to liberate humanity. They don't murder children in their mother's arms because they wish to make commerce over their borders they have a border with egypt closed for decades yet not a missile fires in that direction they hate jews because they've been taught to hate jews that hatred is their oppressor as much as it's ours hatred is not a bullet hatred is not a meme hatred is a spiritual illness and that's why as a rabbi, I find it in my domain to speak of spiritual illness. My grandmother always says, you're so smart, you could have become a doctor. To which I tell her, I did become a doctor, a spiritual doctor. And so right now, there's a spiritual illness in the world, and it's in my domain, in the domain of the spiritual. <clears throat> which means that this is a spiritual war as much as it's a physical one, and I would say even more so. Our bodies have been slain, but this war is fought principally with our souls. And with the Jewish people, our bodies may be separate, but our souls are all united. Our souls are all one, like a single being. So if someone attacks your right arm or your head or your heart or your feet or your hands, 
every single cell within you is mobilized. And that's crucial to know because it means that none of us is powerless. All of us today are soldiers in this war, in this spiritual war. So I ask you a question. How do you win a war against hatred? Well, the first thing you don't do is you don't scroll through images of horror. You're not going to win a war against hatred when you're stun shocked, scrolling through images of horror. And definitely not by succumbing to sadness and despair. Terror is not vanquished by your horror. And you cannot win a war against anything by despair. Actually, I would say those are its prime tools of mass destruction. So instead, what we need to do is implement some paradoxical intervention. Because there's nothing hatred hates more than love. There's nothing that is more potent against darkness than light. Hatred attacks when it perceives the weakness of its host. It flees when there's a unity and there's a togetherness. So I've thought about it, and here's my plan of action. Number one, love. Love, love, love. What does love mean? It means that if you see someone you don't like, do them a favor. Find out what they need. How can you be of assistance? Go out of your way to provide help for those who you love and those who you potentially love. Because you don't know the battle they're fighting and maybe they need your help. Loving every person you meet and see could also just mean asking yourself, what can I learn from this amazing person? Oh, maybe their actions are not so amazing right now. Look at their soul. What can I do to contribute to the life of this person? Again, we are one. We are many cells of a single organism with a single soul. So when you help someone else, you help all of us. You may be the finger. I may be the toe. But we're all part of the same unit. So by helping someone else, we are helping everyone. And essentially, if you want to be selfish, you're also helping yourself. Now, there are many ways that humans can connect. We as Jews have a unique, mysterious connection. I call that a mitzvah. For three and a half thousand years, they, the mitzvahs, have kept us alive. They've kept us vibrant through every difficulty, through every turmoil. They've illuminated the world with our values. They are our lifeline. And I think right now, more than ever, and I know I'm preaching to the choir here, but I'll say it, we have to strengthen our lifeline. We have to connect by uh, lighting Shabbat candles in our home on Friday. The gates of heaven are open. That is a beautiful way to shine light in the darkness. If you're someone who, who any, any mitzvah, putting a mezuzah on your door, a lot of people are talking about taking mezuzahs off their doors. I think the opposite. This is a time to put mezuzah on our doors. We connect through mitzvahs. And not every mitzvah is understood. But every mitzvah is a, literally the word mitzvah means savta. It means connection. That's how we connect. Um, the kids. The kids are such an important part of this. One of the issues that we've seen is an indoctrination of children. And we have to love children, not for who they will become, 
but for who they are right now. They are the innocent voice, the pure voice. Their words of prayer reach the highest places where ours could never reach. I myself have spent a lot more time in prayer with my children than I ever have before in the past few weeks. And I think it's important to tell them that. It's important to empower them. One of the greatest gifts that you can give any child is the knowledge that at any time, in any place, no matter the situation, if you will simply speak to God from your heart, God will listen and God cares. That's a, a really powerful, very comforting message for a child. I also recommend that if you have a child in your life, get them their own little charity box and give them a pile of coins and tell them they should drop a coin in the box each day. Teach them to give. Teach them to have a giving hand. The first thing they should think of when they see a coin is charity, is giving. Give, make sure they have a, a Torah book in their, in their room, a prayer book, a book of Tehillim, a book of Psalms. Listen to them. Listen to their voices. Celebrate them. Empower them. Our job is to combat senseless hatred with senseless love. The only way to combat senseless hatred with senseless love is to love unconditionally. Make sure that any child in your life does not feel helpless in any way. They feel empowered. And my last little thing here is my anecdote to the hatred is to stay positive. I know it's really hard. I'm dealing with the same thing that you're all dealing with. It's hard. We can feel callous to smile in the face of tragedy. And I know about a little voice inside that tells you if you don't look at the horrible images, that means that you don't care. You have to see them. Yeah, I, I have that voice too. Tell that voice right now to make an appointment for another day. Right now is not a time for guilt. It's not a time for insecurity. Right now you're a soldier. A soldier who goes to battle in tears is better off staying home. After the war is won, then you can cry as you dance. But now, now is our time to uplift the spirits of everyone around us. Now is our time to get things done. Now is a time to be together, to be unified, to hold hands, not in tears, but in love, in joy, and in harmony. That's our job right now. Our job is to be together. Just the fact that we can be together here in this room. That's part of our joy. That's part of our job right now is to be together and not to be together in tears. It's very easy. Misery loves company. It's very easy to be together in tears. We have to be together and we have to fight the tears with joy. We have to fight the tears with love. I want to pivot a bit and talk about um, the Kabbalistic anecdote to happiness. I think it's really important because at some point, at some point, it's easy to be happy when things are happy and it's easy to be happy when, when we don't have anything that's challenging us. But when we have these moments that things are challenging us, this is our opportunity to really employ some of the age-old Jewish tradition. So as this is a, a Kabbalah, I thought I would talk a bit about the Kabbalah of happiness. We've spoken so often in the past about our godly soul and our animal soul. If you want to win the battle against the animal soul, 
The only way to do it is with simcha. Now, simcha is not happiness. According to Kabbalah, the difference between happiness and joy, and I'm just using the semantics of words, but simcha really means joy. Happiness is selfish. Joy is selfless. Joy is one of the essential keys to winning the battle that we encounter each day. Joy infuses us with tremendous strength, more than we can even imagine that we possess. Let's let's think about a, a sports, for example. A person that's enlivened with energy and, and enthusiasm, they're going to be able to overcome their opponent. Our spiritual victory, remember this is a spiritual war right now, our spiritual victory and our daily battle is almost guaranteed when we feel energetic, when we feel exhilarated. Because joy frees our heart from worries and troubles that threaten to overwhelm us. It's not that the challenges disappear. But we have a greater ability to cope. Joy, simcha. It gives us the freedom to accomplish almost anything we want to quickly and easily. On the other hand, if our heart is heavy with worries that sadden us, it's as though our hearts are, are sealed shut. We become apathetic. We become lethargic. We lose all our strength. Victory is absolutely impossible in this situation. And that's why a core Jewish value, a fundamental part of our daily spiritual and emotional work is ivdu et Hashem b'simcha, to serve God with joy. It's from Psalms, from Tehillim, chapter 100. It's not just another thing that's important to do. Like you have to pray, I don't know, you have to keep kosher. Uh, you also have to be joyful. That's not what it is. It's the crucial, it's the critical element that must be present throughout our day. We need to pray with joy. We have to give charity with joy. Everything we do, we have to do with joy. Feeling down, feeling depressed, what it does is it creates an opening for the animal soul to dominate us. The animal soul knows that depression makes us feel heavy, depression makes us feel uh, lethargic, depression makes us feel apathetic. And it's much easier to defeat a person who's down, who's heavy and lethargic and apathetic. There's nothing more powerful. There's nothing more effective than someone who is joyous, than someone who is besimcha. And that's why the animal soul invests a ton of effort into getting us depressed. Now, sadness, though at certain times it could have a positive dimension, but as long as it comes at the appropriate time. So that the great descent puts us through a process that can lead to even a greater elevation. For example, sometimes when we feel a little stuck, it's the pain, it's the anguish we experience, it's the tears that we cry freely that enable us to find our way back to the right track. This is the sadness that leads us to the joy. And, and, and in that case, in that particular situation, that's beneficial. But this emotion is actually called meriruts, bitterness, not depression. There's a difference in Kabbalah between meriruts and atzvut. Meriruts means bitterness. That's what meaning depression. Depression weakens a person. Depression causes despair. It makes us feel apathetic. It makes us feel reclusive. Bitterness or 
remorse is what we feel from contemplating a poor state of affairs. It generates a desire to, to change, to progress, to actively climb out of the pit. People call it hitting rock bottom. Because when you hit rock bottom, there's no place to go but up. We're not talking about the kind of bitterness that's caused by resentment, that's caused by self-pity. But we're talking about a soulful introspection that inspires a decision, that, disp that inspires an act for change. So as of now, at this moment, I think we understand what we need. We need joy. But how do you handle the fact that it's not always possible? Maybe now. It's just not possible. You can try. I mean, Rabbi, it's a wonderful idea, hypothetically. But right now, it's uh, don't you know what's going on? It's not possible. And so what I want us to do, and maybe I'll try to give you an idea of it today, and I may have to finish it next week. But I want to talk about how to experience joy and how to overcome our challenges, how to deal with a, a closed, a spiritually congested heart and how to, how to truly, truly be joyful. In order to understand this, we have to discuss the things that prevent us from feeling joy. Things that make us constantly worry. There, there, are, there are two primary causes that make us worry. One is material worries, and the other one is spiritual worries. It's not uncommon for people to experience depression as a result of particular very difficult, traumatic things that happen in life. But we also need to know that these feelings are obstacles that prevent us from being joyful. So what can we actually do when there's a circumstance, like right now, that provides a legitimate reason to worry. What do we do? Don't we deserve to worry sometimes? Don't we deserve to, to be true? You may say, you know, Rabbi, it's just not being honest. I can be fake joyous. I can, I can pretend that I'm happy, but I'm not. And it's not being true to my inner self. It's not being true to who I really am. Right now I'm down. So the first step towards joy is to rid ourselves of sorrow and worries. We have to want to be happy. It, it sounds so simple. It sounds almost strange. I mean, who wouldn't want to be happy? But there's many people who don't want to be happy. They prefer to sit helplessly, to bemoan their fate, to just look at CNN on loop. And most people don't realize in these situations that they have a choice. People asked me, were you scared when you were at the Gaza-Israel border? Yeah, I was scared. Was I worried? No. I wasn't worried because there's one God in the world and whether I'm at the Gaza-Israel border or I'm in Montreal or anywhere else, if God wants to take me, God will take me. And I think that there is there are there are reasons to worry and reasons not to worry. But at those moments, now I'm not expecting that you're going to be able to, in an instant, become a person who can be watching uh, rockets over you the whole day and not and not worry. But the first step is realizing that you are not the end-all, be-all of humanity, that there is a higher power in your life. And that faith, the stronger it is, the more you don't have to worry. Worry is a funny thing. I've said this so many times, but I'll say it again. Pain lasts a moment. 
suffering lasts as long as you want it to. Worry is the suffering. You have a choice. You have a choice. You can helplessly bemoan your fate. Or you can realize that you have a choice. At every situation, you can decide which emotion you're going to employ. There's actually a tendency in our culture to view happy people as shallow and depressed people as deep. So because of that, it's easier to remain unhappy. It fits with the self-image. Oh, I'm a deep person. I'm reflective right now. I'm in a down state of reflection. Happy? What, what are you so happy about? What did you eat this morning? I want to have what she has. Wow. No, it's a choice. It's a choice. Every single day, and maybe now I can't even say every day, every moment. It's a choice because the, the 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 pressure to be sad is happening at every moment. So the first step is to realize and to understand that we need to be happy. We need it. Our families need it. The world needs it. Happier people are healthier. Happier people are more productive. They're more enthusiastic. They're more successful. They're motivated. They're full of a, a, a zest for life. And they're much more willing to help others. And they're, they could be, they have the emotional strength to be of service to others. Our feelings of happiness is an impact on every single person and everything around us. Every single moment that we're happy. And most important, going back to the spiritual, it can easily defeat our animal soul when we're energized, when we're joyous, when we have enthusiasm. Now, now that we understand the value of being joyous, now that we understand that it's a choice now that we have we're in this perpetual motion and this moment that we want to be happy then we can though go and conquer all the reasons that there are for feeling depressed only from the place of joy only from a place of strength can we conquer that worry is not good I know it's hard because I'm speaking to a lot of Jewish mothers here. But worry doesn't help anyone. There are no worries when we're cognizant that everything in our lives comes from God. And we have to really embody that and teach that to our children and teach that to those around us. That there is a God in the world. There is a higher power. I know that each and every one of us truly believe that. But it's not just about believing that. It's about putting it into action. The more that we strengthen that, the more that we strengthen our faith, the easier it's going to be to be able to deal with those things that are bringing us down. Because we can just say, my God is stronger than your worries. My God is stronger than what's than what's bothering you. My my God is stronger than your rockets. Whatever God wants. And with that, it's just the first step. I have some other steps here also, but it's it's such an important it's it's a critical step to experiencing happiness and experiencing life. There are right now a million reasons to bring us down. I don't have to give you any reason to bring you down, which is why 
the battle that we have to fight within is the battle to raise up, to lift us up, to become greater. And we can do it. It's very easy when things are are, are, are going smooth not to think about these things. But all of a sudden, things go uh, downward and and look at, look at what's going on. This is our responsibility now. It's our responsibility to ourselves. It's our responsibility to those that we love. It's a responsibility to the world right now to, to, to uplift. Yesterday, there was an amazing, amazing is not the right word. Yesterday, there was a, a, a critical moment. There was a few Jewish students on campus that had set up a table peacefully protesting the return of 240 hostages. May they be returned immediately. When they were harassed, harassed by people who don't agree with the returning of hostages. And now I wonder why were there people that would not agree with the returning of innocent people to home? It doesn't make any sense to me, but of course they're misinformed and there's nothing we can do about that. And uh, they were quite passionate, these people. And there were many of them. And they circled around uh, the students. And they started harassing the students. And then it became physical. And what, what was the reaction? I was so proud of the Jewish students. They didn't, they, they didn't, they're very, it's very easy when provoked to get involved and to lower yourself. We never can lower ourselves to their level. Never. That's the animal soul. We have to always uplift ourselves. We have to always stand higher. I am proud to be part of a people that will do everything in their power to protect life. Even the lives of those people who tried to kill and did kill our children. We love life. We celebrate life. I'm proud of that. I don't care how... Uh, 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 people will say, "Oh, you're 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 being you're being naively uh, uh, stupid to to a fault." Okay, I'm I'm happy for that. We shall always celebrate life. And the response of those students were, they 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 asked me to take out your tefillin, and they were putting on tefillin, and they were doing mitzvahs instead of fighting back. They were fighting with love, with mitzvahs. That is the Jewish way. That's always been the way that we've won. That's always been our winning thing. We are ethical, we are moral, and we do mitzvahs. And I'm proud, proud to see that. You know, it's when 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 you squeeze the lemon, that's where you know the juice is. When we, at those moments when we're squeezed, at those moments when when we're in that turmoil, not sure what to do, it's so easy to lower ourselves to them. So easy. We have to always remember, no matter what's going on in the world, we need to uplift one another. We have to be together. We have to be united. And we have to be strong. And strength does not come necessarily in fighting back. Be strong. There could be maybe something. Maybe there could be a way to... There's a, there's a silent majority that needs to be educated. Educate. But the haters are going to hate. And there's nothing you can do about that. The animal soul will be an animal soul, and there's nothing you can do about that. But our job is to hone it, is to build it. If we can educate, if there's someone to educate, we will educate them. We will have the knowledge and the ability to educate them. And for those people who are going to hate, we will respond with love. That's the Jewish way.